wonderful perversity, Film Independent has put together a panel of directors here that have absolutely nothing in common, except that <laughs> all of them, I think, are younger than I am, and everyone has made a movie considerably better than most of us could ever hope to in this life. Um, Shereen Davis made a first feature about immigrants after threading her way through filmmaking labs and learning how to make movies at Columbia University. Michael Hoffman just made an umpteenth feature, this time about a cranky old man and his wife, after working with at least 16 different distributors, eight of which no longer exist, unless you might want to be generous and call MGM a going concern. <laughs> and James Gray started making movies when independent film was all about scammers scamming scammers, as long as they did it with wit and style, and he suddenly popped up with a very complicated love story set in the dry cleaning business. Uh, the question becomes, what can we learn from such people? And I think they're the ones who ultimately will answer that. I would love to start, though, with the simplest and most existential of questions for all of them, and that is, why did you make this movie? And James, I hope it wasn't because you had coupons. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> somebody once asked Stanley Kubrick that question, and since he's about 100,000 times more brilliant than I am, I'm going to quote him. Somebody, he said, I, I can't answer that, he said, in his Bronx accent. He said, it's a little bit like asking you why you married your wife. She's good looking and has a lovely figure, but there are a lot of women that have lovely figures and nice faces, and I can't answer that. Just, you know, it's a weird chemical thing. And I guess the only way I can put it is you try to make films as personal as you can. And um, I was trying to make <clears throat> another picture and for a little light reading, I pulled Dostoevsky off the shelf. And uh, I read a novella he wrote called White Nights. Well, I had read it a long time ago, but anyway, there's something struck me about it, which is that it treated love as a kind of a, an issue of, for serious discourse, not as a joke. So I was just, uh, I was interested in trying something like that. It's a very difficult question you ask. Because it's, there's something that's almost unknowable about why you pursue what you pursue anyway. I mean, obsession is not rational, right? So you become, if, you, if you want to make these kind of movies, you have to be obsessed. So it's not a rational thing. There's nobody in a costume, you know, a space suit running around. Saying, I mean, not that I have anything against superhero movies. Some of them can be very entertaining, but the, the, they don't require the same commitment to get them made. They just don't. Shuri, the, the same answer? <laughs> could, could, could you have made sorry, any sorry. other movie? <laughs> Um, no, my, I think my answer is, is, is a little more um, uh, straightforward. I mean, for me, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's actually very similar in that, you know, it, I made this movie for a very personal reason. Um, and I think, you know, and in watching the movie, I think of myself, I see my 14-year-old self feeling very out of place in a small town in Ohio and uh, feeling incredibly misunderstood and uh, and my and you know my family in this small town went through a lot of the things that the family in the movie goes through, just in you know being treated as outsiders and, and some of the discrimination and um, and it was that time in my life that really opened my eyes to the fact that you know simply as an Arab American our stories weren't being told and you know so it's a much simpler answer but it's um, it's and it's well no it's not better it's just it's a first film and, and so it's very much. Uh, it's very much based on uh, my family's experience in a small town in Ohio. It's inspired by my family, um, and it came from the need to tell our story, to tell the story of what happened during the first Gulf War when you know we were ostracized, and my dad, who's a doctor, lost a lot of his patients, and the Secret Service visited my high school because of a rumor that she threatened to, my sister threatened to kill the president. So it was, um, we got death threats on a daily basis. It was, it was that kind of... Um, just realizing how absurd people's behavior could become and you know when when they were being fed fear through the media and that was you know that's that's why I made the movie and Michael you've worked across the board and and had some very very different pictures why this um, I, I, this I, I when you first asked the question I had an answer and I maybe I will give it, but then I got these answers would seem way more interesting, <laughs> and, and 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 maybe that's part of the key because I think I mean growing up in 
this little tiny town in Idaho, which is a very, I mean, a very different kind of experience, because I think your experience is really there, like, you're so far from the center of the world that you're not certain that there are any stories that you'd have that would be worth telling. Um, and it took a long, and I think there's some part of me that looked to literature and looked outside myself for, for sort of surrogates or ways to tell stories. I think I was always, I mean, really drawn to things that weren't what I was about. Or, or, or rather, I found what I was about in kind of indirect ways. And this movie was really an example of that. I read the book in 1990 when it first came out, and I didn't see what the movie was at all. I mean, I just made, I went and read a couple of Tolstoy biographies and, and felt better about myself. But uh, then I read it again, like 14 years later, after I'd been married for 12 years, and I saw exactly what I wanted to make a movie about. And I found a way to make a movie about the, you know, my wife is here somewhere, I think, and I will say, I've said it before, she refers to it as Art Imitates Wife. I refer to it as a <laughs> film about the tragic comedy of marriage. But, 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 but that's, I think that I was, you know, somehow working stuff out about about our our relationship and about my feelings about the difficulty of living with love and the impossibility of living without love. I think that's what that it, and it was central and it, it was actually something that was evolving through the five years it took to to make the movie. So you're a complete inversion of Shireen because it, she took yeah, exactly, exactly what's exactly. around her and you took exactly what wasn't, but it was right. Yeah, that's what I was. That was. I, I wish I had said it like that so quickly <laughs> and so elegantly. Is is there anything promising about this landscape? Is anything getting better, or are we still in a downward spiral in terms of economic structure, ability to get your pictures seen? I, I don't, I don't, I don't see a lot of 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 you know new distribution companies being being formed. I mean, there's always you know there's always some some movement. It is as but I but I at the moment I still see more more. Uh, the, more of them dying than, 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 than being born. But what's interesting as well, though, is that there are new forms of distribution that uh -huh. are emerging that, that are giving you know, movies different, you know, different kinds of exposure and different ways of, of do, being Do you seen. see anything in that that really would work for you? I mean, there's a huge debate about whether well, like on-demand, you know, video on-demand is, is essentially day, a fraud, day, yeah, or whether, whether it's, it's basically going to work or it's so small in terms of economic you know, payback that it might as well not exist. Uh, do, do you think it'll help you? Well, this, my film was done video on demand thing, and I think it's really, really awful. Um, I, uh, talk, I have would you no talk about that? Because I'm so interested in Well, I have very why, little optimism. I mean, I, I, I want to be the guy that comes here and goes, you know what, in the future, there's going to be all these different distributions, and you can watch it on your phone, and, and that's all true, maybe. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you right now, I mean, in the interest of pessimism, uh, <laughs> I, you know, if I saw Lestrade on my fucking t iPhone, that would not be a good way to watch yeah. that movie, yeah. you know? Yeah. So, I mean, everybody can talk about it. I go to meetings all the time. They're like, yeah, but the distribution model is going to change. Yeah. And I got all these people saying, hey, I saw your movie. I'm like, what? Yeah, I was in a hotel, <laughs> and I turned it on, and there it was. It was really good. And I shot it in 235, and you know, I'm up my own ass, so I'm thinking I'm going to make the greatest movie ever, and I'm going to do Lawrence Arabia's aspect ratio in there. And then nobody gives a shit. They're going to watch it in their hotel room, picking their nose. Yeah. <laughs> so I have no optimism whatsoever. And I, and I have to say, and I'm, I promise I'll, I'll shut up in a second, but I, I just recently, I'm, I'm a huge opera fan, I got that reference in your picture before she started Thank talking you. about it, Michael. I got it. Um, <laughs> and, and, and I go and, and uh, you know, if, if you're a fan of opera, the, the, the movement called Verismo, which was, I guess, about 1890, something like that, which found its origins actually, actually in the writings of Emile Zola. And, and it's Puccini's La Boheme and Cavalier Rusticana by Mascagni, a whole bunch of things. And if you follow the history of opera, it actually mirrors what is going through, in movies are going through right now in an eerie and horrible way, which was that movies, you know, the opera was very popular, right? You know, 400,000 people lined the streets when Verdi died, and, you know, for his funeral. Uh, they were very big spectacles, and then there was this very small movement, sort of like the 70s in American cinema, you know, where you got these amazing pictures about, like, you know, guys on oil rigs and stuff. And then after that, they abandoned that completely and made these like, huge fascist epics like, you know, like Neroni, the opera by Mascagni, which nobody knows now, but was like very popular fascist opera. And then the medium died. 
And I don't think that people should, I, mean, I hear it all the time, people say, no, that's so pessimistic. And I really, I, I, I find that objectionable because it means that they're not looking at the facts, which is that people are not inculcated enough to love movies as an art form. It's a popular culture thing. And that's a problem. So the audience is educated to want McDonald's. So that's the real problem. I'm, I'm, I'll shut up now. Because no, I'm but, uh, no, you, you, are you thinking it's that tough, or are you thinking it's not quite that tough? Oh, you're talking yeah, to me? Well, yeah, no, yeah, I, I see know, it I in your just, face. I, just, I see I was, it in was, your I was, face. I was just having a moment there. We're mourning over here. I wasn't, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess I have to hope that there's that there remains a kind of hunger for for story that occurring in some kind of three acts. I'm sort of old fashioned about that. Where do that. you see that? Where do I see it? You say you say you have hope. Well, I don't see oh. any evidence of that. I see pictures that make no sense. Am, well, I, am I the well, curmudgeon from hell? Uh, I think I am. No, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I see, I see the little movies. I see the little smaller movies come out and and make sense. Oh yeah, you but know? but and nobody goes to them. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, that, I mean, I'm yeah, but that's true. That's true. But I guess, I guess, I guess a whole bunch of people going to something. I guess I've never been. No, I've never. Th I should. That's where I go wrong. I never. That's never my goal. I never. I never think about. I mean, no, I, I, I like to work in the theater. I like. I just like to have some people in the room. Engaging in the story, I never really think about. But that's gosh, why there's you know, no it, distributor, distributors. That's why. No, no, I see. I'm wrong. I see. I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm misguided. I'm just old. Fashioned in a way that I will, you know, I, I'm in the die, I'm in the boat that's sinking. I just, I, I, okay, so how do you how it's do you true. cope I, with I this? Does anybody sitting up here know for dead certainty the what the next can't, picture is? The, the reason you can't cope yeah, with it ahead. is because of, of 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 what James said. These things sort of seek you out, and you tell the story that you that you have to tell. I mean, now I go through my usual process after I. So it's like, oh, I'm out of director jail. Oh, I'm not back from the dead. People want to have meetings. People want, to, and then I go and I try to make a rational choice about what I should do next. You know, this would be a more commercial choice. This would be a more intelligent choice. This would make send a signal to the industry that I want to be a commercial filmmaker. And I can't fucking do it. I just can't figure out how to bring myself right. to do it. I wish I could. I do. I swear to God, I wish I so could. So you don't know where you're headed next. <laughs> I have seven meetings. Okay. <laughs> the, 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 Shereen and make. James, does either of you know? I mean, I ask this because of, precisely because of this landscape that you've described. And I think that that dreadful moment of going from one rung in the trapeze, you know, and grabbing the next rung must be chilling. Do you know yet? Where we're going where, next? Where, as far where, as like where you what, go next? Where, do you know? I, I, you just keep going. You just go. I mean, I do. You, do you, you have know, a film in on, mind right yes, now? Yes, I have. Um, I have a screenplay that I'm working on that um, I'm right now. We're aiming to shoot in the fall. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a number of other things in development. I mean, I, I you know I sort of choose to ignore what's happening in the distribution landscape because it's just it's really incredibly depressing. And uh, I think you just have to keep doing what you're doing and have faith that someone will see it somewhere, you know, hopefully not on an iPhone. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I just I what now do you in do? the search for one good thing, one good thing is that you did have all of this support from organizations, nonprofits, people, you know, who um, outside of of profit were able to help you get that picture developed and born. Will you do it that way well, again? Well, I, th I think what's happening and what's going to have to happen as well is that people are going to have to continue to find non-traditional means of not just getting their movies made but getting them seen on the mm -hmm. big screen. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of, you know, do-it-yourself distribution happening right now and maybe that's the wave of of the future for filmmakers like, you know, maybe all filmmakers. I have no mm -hmm. idea. I mean, m maybe independent, maybe, you know, maybe more than that but it's you know it's changing and it's shifting and right now I feel like we're in the middle of it so we can't quite see it and everyone's sort of you know theorizing and and I just you know I'm, I'm gonna just wait and see what happens and try and keep things open but yeah America was financed very non-traditionally it was supported in you know in, in non-profit you know independent film land and by film festivals and um, you know it, it, one percent of all films get distributed, and you know, people told me that again and again. And um, you know, this this little movie that's inspired by my family, that's based on true events, that's you know, was was one of those one percent of movies. And and so, I had to just keep believing that I would make this movie and that it would be seen, and that you know, so I so couldn't focus on the other stuff. It's not something you simply duplicate. Yeah, the process that you went through on the first, because of the non-traditional way it happened, 
isn't something that anybody else is going to be able to pick up and replicate. Well, I think, the th I think the thing to take away from it is that, is that you know, you have to invent it yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, any, you can, I mean, really anything can happen at this point. That's, that's, the, one, that's the exciting thing that's, that's going on, is that mm -hmm. everything is changing. And there's no longer a monopoly, really, mm -hmm. actually. That's, that's really exciting as well. And I think that's going to open the doors for new kinds of storytelling. And it's certainly opening the doors right now for, for an openness to, to you know, um, actors that we haven't seen, for fresh faces, for you know, lower budget movies, for, you know, who knows? You just, I think that you're really, there's, you really have to be creative about the ways in which you're going to tell your story and going to get it made and going to get it out there. James, do you know where you're headed next? I, I do. I, I will say that everything that you said is true and really great. I mean, it's it, the one thing I will say is absolutely true is if I'm doing something, I never think about the pessimistic side of it, having just talked for 40 minutes about that. I really don't. I just, you just do it, and then whatever happens, happens. I'm, we're talking about it here. We can talk about how dark I think it is. But when I'm doing it, I never think, oh, this is going to be so hot, because then you wouldn't do it. So you just do it, and then you know you hope that something get, how something good happens. I know what I'm doing next. I, I've had a sort of a different frustration, which uh, involves. I'm mean, a, a little pretentious here, but you know, a great quote I once heard that Truffaut said about movies. He said, "Cinema is part truth, part spectacle." And what is interesting to me is that there are avenues now where you can deliver spectacle, right? And there are which is the big films. And there are areas where you can deliver truth. The best films, or I should say for me, were the ones that combined both, which was sort of what United Artists was doing, for example, 30 years ago. And that's gone. So to the degree to that I'm, I'm pessimistic, I will say this, one more thing. Uh, you never know, right? Because we could be sitting here in 1963, and the music is Percy Faith Orchestra, and it's all, you know, Finette Funicello on the beach. And then you got, you know, the Beatles and Bonnie and Clyde a few years later. So you never know. And that I will, I, but I do know what I'm doing next. So good answer to the question. I don't know, I'm rambling here. No. I you don't get out a lot, as you can see. <laughs> <laughs> it's begun to feel to me almost as if independent film and studio film, which had begun to converge in right through the era of, you know, the late 90s, mid 90s, Fox Searchlight, it all looked like it was coming together. Looks like they're moving radically apart, like into just just far, far different universes. Uh, is that happening? I mean, do, do any of the three of you anticipate doing studio work, or are you going to be on this side of an enormous divide now, and perhaps not make a leap back into the other? Is that me? Yeah, well, okay. you you've yeah. been there, and yeah. James could be. I don't know. I mean, there new. may be certain kinds of studio movies that you could, you know, see yourself. Doing, um, but uh, but the divide is the divide is getting is definitely I, I experience it as a lot greater. I mean, don't, I mean you know there's not a movie there's there's all the middle has fallen out of the industry. All those kind of you know a great thrill, jagged edge. Where would that movie get made now? You know, I mean, and it's a really good thriller. You know, and and that's a hard and knowing where those are, knowing where a, a comedy for I mean I don't know how soap dish would get made now. You know, I don't know where that would sit in the world. Um, sure. So uh, do you ever see yourself going there, or do you, do you really see yourself dwelling in a separate universe? And no, I could definitely see myself going there. I mean, at yeah. this point, I'm, I'm I'm remaining open to all options, and you know, actually, currently, am am possibly going to be um, rewriting and directing a movie for Fox Searchlight. So, uh, uh, can can you say anything at all about that particular project? What what it is, what it's like, um, the nature of it. I mean, I'm, I'm interested from the, just the standpoint of seeing where the bridges and connections still exist. You mean story-wise? Well, story-wise, project-wise, anything that you're comfortable saying. You know, just yeah, so that I we mean, can understand know, I, how the director of America, you know, could sure. step still into a quasi-studio world. Um, what kind of project or where are you with it? Um, it's in very early stages of development, so I would take it on as, as kind of a page one rewrite. And it's, um, it's a story kind of about female empowerment, you could say. Um, it's, uh, it's a dramedy with a lot of, it's a drama with a lot of humor. Um, and I would say that those are the two elements that really Emrika has in common with this other project and a few other things. Do you, uh, other than 
taking, you know, then cooking and making bolognese, do you make time for a studio meeting every now and again? Yeah, I do all the time, because we were talking about, the, you're trying to find the movie that's in, the, that you call it the middle, I was saying that the truth and spectacle thing is really what I was trying to say. So yeah, of course, all the time. I mean, the thing I'm doing next is uh, hopefully in that place. But I don't know, I feel like the, st and yes, you, uh, you brought that, I think the gap is widened because the, there has been a kind of collective decision to make, really to focus on one segment of the movie-going audience and to keep, movie-going is kind of a habit, you know. So I'll, I'll talk to my dad, who's, you know, pretty pretty crusty guy, and I'll say, you know, uh, he'll say, well, I can't see any of these pictures. There's no good pictures to see. And my dad is, you know, s he's 73 years old, got tons of time on his hands, and not a lot, but a little bit of disposable income, a perfect person to go see a movie. What's he going to go see? I, he's not going to go see, like, Dark Knight. I mean, maybe he would enjoy it. I doubt it, but, you know, it's possible. Which is, I mean, I, I, you know, I found things about Dark Knight I thought were great, but I'm saying for him, that's a whole segment of the audience that's not being at attended to. And, you know, it's uh, very instructional because apparently the number one movie on Netflix last year was The Conversation, which is a completely weird thing to predict. So it tells you that there is a whole... Well, no, I mean, it is funny, but at the same time, it tells you there's a whole segment, doesn't it, of the uh, audience, American moving audience, that's totally, uh, like, they're not even catering to at all. So it is there, but they're just, those, f like, 42-year-old women who are English teachers who might like the conversation, they're not going, they're just not going to the movies. They're Netflix, they're Netflixing uh, Jules and Jim. That's what they're doing. And so the movie business got those people out of the habit of going. And the only people going now are, like, 13-year-olds, you know. <laughs> no, but it's true. I mean, that's who goes to the movies. Wow, I'm such a, I don't mean to be a downer. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm really sorry. I, 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 sorry. I'm sorry, Michael. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I'm just thinking about, you know, Universal not very long ago, you know, just put all their drama into turnaround. They just put all of their drama into turnaround, and some of it had with big people attached to it. And they came out and they said they want to make tentpole movies and broad comedies and, and cartoon movies. You know, and one of the that, scarier things that happened right at the time that occurred is that you know, this is all in the wake of last year's Oscar race. And there were a couple of companies, uh, Paramount being one, Universal being another, that were, um, if you talk to the executives in the wake, you know, Benjamin Button, Frost Nixon, they were bitter, they were angry, they were unhappy for the simple reason that they had just dragged through a five-month process of becoming the foil to what they knew was going to win. You know, so they spent $50 million on a picture, had to go to all the dinners, and they were there as window dressing, knowing from the beginning that Slumdog Millionaire was going to walk away with the prize, and came to the conclusion that that part of the apparatus was broken, that, that the whole awards game, which corrupt and awful as it was, did give you a platform to float these pictures, didn't work for them anymore. And that's kind of apocalyptic when they, they pulled out. I mean, it does take the platforms out from under. And the I just think there's way less interest in, I mean, you know, the, most of the people who are working at the studios, there's fewer and fewer filmmakers and more and more people who come from, from a marketing world, and that's what they feel, that's where they feel their responsibility, mm -hmm. you know? is in terms of marketing, having a concept they can market. I mean, this is, I'm not saying anything well, that everybody doesn't know, but, but it is, it is obviously, it has shifted hugely. If you look at the people who were making Nashville and making Five Easy Pieces and making the, the, the Godfather movies at Paramount, I mean, that's a different breed. They're completely different people from different backgrounds who think their job is a different thing. Is there any reality to this notion that, um, you know, that the, the digital revolution on the marketing side, um, gives you ways without spending money to connect enough audience to a picture to to create it? I mean, uh, Marika or any of these pictures, did you find that, you know, that the gospel is that we don't have to go buy the New York Times ad anymore, that there's some way that we can use community, social network, whatever it is to uh, create audience for picture and float it. Has anyone had that experience? Has it actually happened? I haven't ever made a movie that was, I think, interesting enough in that way. That you know, I wish I wish I did. But I mean, very specific cases, right? Mm -hmm. That it's that it's happened. You know, uh, in things that everybody knows, Paranormal Activity or Blair Witch or whatever. What, was there a community element to Amrika? Um, yeah, there was actually. I think most of the marketing element, most of the marketing effort on the film was uh, focused on grassroots 
um, and internet. And I, you know, it was it was very difficult actually. I mean, the the film it was there was there was a really big effort made within the community, but I think that I don't know that we had enough manpower to really follow through that effort. I think that you know the the digital thing and the online requires constant, constant, constant effort. And actually, you know that that requires money. So um, it, it sort of it was an interesting learning experience for me because I, um, it, it's not like oh let me post this on Facebook and everyone will go. You know it was <laughs> it was like oh you know how do you I don't really know how you I think that we try to do that but we just didn't have didn't have enough of uh, of the manpower behind you know behind the internet thing or the digital revolution and it, yeah. I, I don't know. And your films don't seem to be that paranormal activity. I mean, well, no, I, I have not seen any evidence that that stuff works at all. I mean, in yeah. the case of Blair Witch or paranormal activity, it's not actually dependent on the film. It's dependent on the concept, which is a very different idea. Mm -hmm. And it has to do with, uh, really, the beginnings of it were of The Godfather, and then it was Jaws was really the thing that, that did it, which was that the method of distribution changed and they used to, as, as I'm sure many, most of you know, you used to release the A pictures in two theaters and then you sort of let word of mouth spread and the pictures played for a year or whatever, and then the first run theaters, second run theaters, and then finally, you know, it, it sort of word of mouth either killed the picture or did well, but today it's open in 4,000 theaters instantly, so it's very, it's not at all word of mouth dependent. It's not at all quality dependent. What it is is it's, it's it's concept, immediate understood concept dependent. And, and that is not anything that I understand for internet, or creating a network, no, that's, uh, to me, I don't know, that strikes me as bullshit. You know, I, to me it's like put all the goddamn commercials on you can so that the audience goes first week. If they changed the way that movies played in theaters, where the, where the movie actually required, and that's also the reason, by the way, the 42-year-old English teacher doesn't go to the, the movies anymore, because they used to be uh, word of mouth dependent. They're not anymore, they're now concept dependent. So I think that's a big difference, and I don't think the digital uh, era changes that at all. But do you, so you're saying that you don't think movies are word of, that there is no word of mouth dependent well, There, there is anymore. word of mouth, but they're not dependent on it. They used to be entirely dependent on it. You know, I mean, The Godfather uh, opened, I think, I think in 300, the or it, oh, maybe, I think it opened in 300, Jaws opened in 300 theaters. That was considered, like, major, huge, blow-it-out release, which today would be beyond, you know, that's like 300 theaters. That's the, you know, Fox Searchlight does that in their sleep. <laughs> so uh, the word of mouth, of course, I mean, Avatar, Avatar, people obviously loved it. You know, they kept going, so that's why it, it made the money it did. But for the most part, no, which is why you see these big movies and they have like 60% drops the next week. It just means that the core audience went immediately and that was that. Is part of the problem, though, that these movies don't, uh, don't have the opportunity to stay in theaters long enough for the word of mouth to actually kind of spread and take effect? Oh, I think that's that true, right? right? With Bonnie right and Clyde, well? right? Bonnie and Clyde, yeah. why, the move picture was released on a, on a, as a B feature in, in, in Drive-Ins in August of 67, but... There was still the opportunity for word of mouth, and then they re-released the film, and everyone changed their opinions about how good it was. And that would never, ever in a trillion years happen today. Today, Bonnie and Clyde would come out, and you know, you'd get a couple of spirit noms, and that would be it, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I, I suspect that what we need is somebody out here to um, be the genius who can essentially figure out how to replicate tracks that work. I mean, there was somebody. Uh, the, the Blind Side is not um, an independent film, really, and it's, it's not Warner a film Brothers. that fits. Yeah, it's, it's Warner Brothers, but yeah. there's there's an interesting reality behind that film, and that is that when it came to stitching together an audience, there was an enormous sub, and it wasn't just the Christian audience. You know, I mean, there was a sports audience, a Christian audience, there was a middle American audience, there was, a, a, and and there was a lot of self conscious thinking about how to string together ahead of time. Um, using a lot of internet, using churches, all that stuff, a non-traditional, not very expensive underlying campaign. Now, the problem with all of that is, okay, it worked that time. How does anybody create a track? You know, if somebody could create that independent film community track that, that people would light to them and say, okay, now, you know, we have Amrico, we have Two Lovers, whatever, and, and begin to light it up without overspending and, and, and duplicate, get it in theaters, there's something can happen, but it's not close. Well, it hasn't I think, Sony, I think Sony, Sony Pictures Classics does it 
pretty well in a kind of traditional way mm -hmm. where they go out and they, they, they do what they, they start in two cinemas and depending how it's doing, they'll expand to four. That's what they've done with Last Station. Finally, you know, we were on 300 screens last week, but the word of mouth has kept it buoyed up, you know, and they really, they really, but they, they also kind of right from the beginning go, we're completely review de dependent. You know, they're not going to buy anything. They won't buy anything at a festival until they've seen reviews and they call up critics and they show it. They get a hold of a screener and they show it to critics. They try to limit their, everybody's, you know, risk averse in some way. They try to limit it that way to make sure they're going to have the kind of support that will generate the word of mouth. But then you have to ask yourself, well, what's a success? Is it a success if Last Station makes $8 million? I don't know. Maybe that is a you well, know, maybe, well, just, and maybe that's okay. Uh, maybe uh, uh, part uh, of what we're dude, you're like not, you're like Spielberg or something. You're, you're out there. Yeah, well, another no, part no, of no, this, what but you know what? I, what I'm yeah. getting at is, I mean, no, I'm being serious. What we're not really addressing is the fact that independent movies, you know, probably do have to be made for a price, continue to be made for a price. Even that price may even get lower. That allows them to be a success without making a huge amount of money. Does the world help any of happen. you? Was there an international element that was substantial enough on any of these three pictures to float it? Yes, Germany. We love Germany. Okay. <laughs> Germany, if you have a, a audience a or film, subsidy, sub, sub, subsidy on audience mm. crew. I like I like the whole thing. Berlin, <laughs> great place. We should all move there. You can buy a, actually, but you can still buy a house there for three hundred thousand um, dollars. It's uh, no, but but anyway, Germany. We had eight million dollars in German soft money and and state backed loans. Eight million out of wow. about thirteen. So, and and that money is there to be accessed in a co-production situation. And honest to God, I mean, I just watched before I came here, Ghost Rider, which I'm sure was shot. In, in it's very good. Was it shot? I'm guessing it was shot in part in Germany. Maybe it wasn't. I know it was, Oliver Twist. Yeah, and and that's that's why he's got a huge amount of support, and so he decides to shoot America in in Germany. I mean, mm. seriously, if you have a movie that you can figure out how Germany could work for you, you know, it's well, a was, great place to make a film, and there's a lot, a lot of support. It's more than anywhere in the world. Was international good to either of you two? Yeah, America um, was largely supported out of Canada. And my Canadian producer is actually right over there, Christina. Um, it w we were about 30%, was it 30% finance through Canada, through um, uh, was it, was tax it government credits money, and provincial Canada equity? Credits? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So um, that really allowed us to close our financing and go into production. So we shot the U.S. We shot Canada for the U.S. We shot in Winnipeg. And and how about markets? I mean, distribution. Did did you sell it abroad? Was there enough money in that in other you know other areas of the world to float the picture? Uh, you mean pre-sale wise? Well, uh, even after release. I mean. Yeah. Well, we we pre-sold the Middle East was the only territory that we pre-sold, and since um, and and yeah, after the film was made, uh, we sold. I think like maybe twenty territories or something. And, and James, your your pictures well, are far my more native film, experience. The, the, my film is, you know, mostly financed by the French. Uh, I, I am a an object of Gallic fetish for reasons <laughs> that I don't quite understand. <laughs> and uh, uh, so I'm I'm like Michael, except I'm for France. You see, so we're gonna we're gonna replay the Maginot line yeah. right here. Uh, oh, I I, um, I know the French have been very kind to me, and they gave me uh, most of the money to make the picture, and they 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 they're the best. But you know, it's true. The Europeans, I mean, they do. I mean, for them, film is an art form, so they love directors. They love pictures that aren't necessarily straight down the middle. And I mean, there's a craziness to it, but at the same time, it's beautiful. You know. Wow, this this has become a guerrilla business again. I mean, that honestly, that's what I learned here is that uh, it the search for one good thing was tougher than I figured. And you know what you see is you're all in one way or another saying you've got to fall back on grit, while luck, all the things that 20 years ago were making independent film and kind of fell away in the 90s. I think we had to throw this open up. The, do you guys have a, a process here that we can start getting some questions from the audience? Uh -oh. Here they come. I would just say wide open, no holds barred, and I hope there are a lot of them. Uh, hey, uh, so we talked a lot about distribution. I wanted to bring it back to craft and directing, and I was wondering what you guys look for in actors in the casting process. And while you're on set, do you 
uh, direct from Video Village or do you direct from set? And what the difference are for you as directors? Uh, well, I started as an actor, and so I think that that, for me, is, I mean, it's kind of how I, the, when I sort of, when I try to figure out what it, how I would direct if I hadn't acted, I can't figure out what it would be, so, so that's, I mean, it's really a s essential, central part of the experience to me, and I spend a lot, as much time with the people and trying to create a kind of, I mean, this sounds like bullshit, but uh, some some sort of sense of of community, and that we're involved in a you know in the same task together, and then, and I try to listen a lot, and I try, and I also, you know, talk a lot, but I don't sit behind the monitor. Um, sometimes I don't use a monitor. I've gone movies where I didn't use a monitor at all. Um, I've gone now. I think it's okay, but it just yeah, I think you it's really a trap and dangerous to sit there too much. I think you need to be engaged with the people who are putting all this stuff at risk. Because it is a risky, scary thing to be an actor performing. And however confident they might seem, or however angry they might get, or however, however you know, opinionated they might be, on some level, there's a certain degree of terror. And, and no matter how many times they've, they've succeeded, I always think the most amazing thing is no matter how many movies you made, and how many movies all these actors have made, when you show up on that, the, the day to shoot a scene, everybody thinks this is the time it's not going to work. I always say it's always haunted by some anxiety about is it really going to come together? Mm -hmm. And somehow as a director, I think a lot of your job is figuring out how do you defeat that and how do you create a, a, as, as tensionless an environment as possible um, because I think that's when the best work gets done. Uh, yeah, I actually also found myself on set with the actors. Um, I had a little tiny monitor with me that I would glance down at, and I was, and I would find myself often sitting on an apple box, staring at the monitor, um, or no, looking at the monitor with a little notebook, staring at the actors, like writing notes because I did a lot of long takes and I didn't trust my memory, so I would I would write little notes during the take for whatever adjustments I I wanted to give, and and found it much more. Um, just it, definitely a better a better choice to be on set because I felt like I was you know in it with them as opposed to you know kind of back here watching you know judging sort of you know it was just a, a much uh, better experience and then I could not just look at the monitor I could actually look at the actors and be present with them and think you know am I feeling something am I believing them am I you know am I being affected some way by this. And that was really the question that I asked throughout the whole process from casting, you know, to being on set. You asked, you know, what we look for in actors. And and I think it's, you know, for me it was really like finding the people who most embodied the spirit of the characters and watching them very closely from the moment they walked in um, throughout the whole, you know, throughout the entire audition, wondering, you know, if I believe them as the character and, and if I, you know, believe them, period. Um, and really just kind of getting to know them is, you know, you don't have a lot of time, so it's just asking questions and trying to figure out who they were in the, you know, short time you have with them. Uh, for me, you asked two different questions, both of which are sort of very important, obviously. The first thing I would say about the Video Village thing, um, it depends, I think, on how you started out. Because I, I started out, in the first picture I did, I had the crappiest video tap ever. And so I never looked at it. And I find myself now almost never consulting the tap, always watching right below camera if I can. And I think there is a reason for it. Because the cinema is a very intimate medium. You know, the best seat you have in stage is 20 feet away from the actor. The equivalent of a cowboy, right? Maybe a wider, wide shot, you know? But I remember, I remember seeing Robert De Niro in a play in New York called Cuba and His Teddy Bear. This was maybe 25 years ago. And I was so excited. I was 14 years old, I think, something like that. I was going to see Robert De Niro on stage. And he was very unimpressive. <laughs> uh, to me at the time. I'm sure he was great. But uh, to me at the time, I found it unimpressive, even though at the time he was my favorite actor in, on screen. And I couldn't understand why. And then I watched Raging Bull again, and I understood because it's so intimate. Everything he's doing is very small. And the camera tells everything you need to know. It's the ultimate truth teller. So all the actor has to do is think it, and somehow the camera sees it. So to me, video, video tap is not so helpful. It creates an extra level of distance between you and the actor. I don't know if that makes sense. 
but I find that it's very important to look at what they're doing. As for casting, I never look for somebody that resembles or acts like the person I wanted for the role in any way. And I know that seems counterintuitive, but it's not. I hear people sometimes, thank God nobody here, but say, I want my vision on the screen, I'm gonna get it, I don't care what happens. And to me, it's a grotesque error because there are actors involved and cinematographers and editors and all these people who are way better at their job than, than you are at their job. And so their job is to expand the idea that you had in mind. Do you know what I mean? And, and your job as the director is basically to be the ultimate filter, to embrace the things in casting, to embrace the things that expand the original scope of the idea and try to get rid of the, the things, or people in this case, sadly, that get in the way of your original idea. Do you know what I mean? So when you're casting, I'm always looking for somebody who brings something interesting and surprising that I never thought of, but is almost an embellishment on the original conception. I hope that makes some shred of sense. Hi, another uh, I would just want to say one more thing about that. The other thing that I really do notice the, that I look for is, um, <laughs> Is I the more the more I do this, the more I'm looking for storytelling allies in the mm -hmm. actors. Actors not who aren't necessarily don't worship at the altar of emotional truth. I mean, obviously that want to, that are very good solid actors and acknowledge that, but see that they have that we're partners in telling a story, and that the story is in the thing is in the end the master that we're all serving. And you know, some actors are just staggeringly good storytellers, and I had a bunch of them. Uh, good evening. I was just curious, can you talk a little bit about um, when you feel the screenplay is ready? Um, I know that you, um, you know, especially you, Shireen, you talked about, you know, you spent years developing the idea and eventually writing the script. I'm just curious, uh, when do you feel like you can make the call to actually start uh, pre-production on, on the screenplay and say this is as, as, as good as it's going to get so I can get started on the movie? Wow, that's a tough question. I mean, on some level, the screenplay is never ready. I get to be the pessimist now. Um, that's a really hard question. I think you have to, you know, I think that what we do as writers is we get really lazy because we get tired. And so I think the most important thing you, you need to do is to, is to really be realistic and to listen to those voices in your head that say, this isn't quite right, this isn't quite right. And one thing that I started to do on Amrika was that I would... I mean, I, I read that script so many, like dozens of times. I don't know why. I just would torture myself by, it was just like, I felt like I needed to know every, you know, every word of that story, every, of the script, every punctuation mark. And I started to realize that there were scenes that I liked better than other scenes. And so, I, and it was funny because I think after like the 20th draft, I was like, well, fuck it. I'm just going to keep writing forever. Like I'm, I'm going to give up the idea that it's ever going to be done or ever going to be ready. And I'm just going to, and I started to get into it like, okay, I'm going to make it better. And, and when I realized that I had scenes that I like better than others, then I was like, well, I want this scene to be as good as that other scene that I really love. And that, you know, it's sort of like, I don't know if it's just ways that you kind of psych yourself or, you know, get yourself excited to dive back in and do the torturous work of rewriting. Um, but that was, you know, that was something that I that I did, and and it was a way for me to gauge whether or not I felt like I was ready to shoot something. I wanted every scene to really be as good as my favorite scene in the script, and 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 you know, and and you have to really think big picture as well, and overall, and and about each character arc and each relationship, and just make sure that you've vigorously worked them as as much as possible. And I think it's helpful too to get feedback from other people and to you know, give people the script and be like, you know, what do you take away from it? What is it about to you? You know, what are your thoughts? And just, you know, when you start getting the feedback of, it's great, I think you're ready. Or, you know, you get little notes, then you know you're getting closer and closer. And I think that that's also a good gauge. Well, I mean, it's a craft as much as it is an art, you know, the screenwriting. And there are... I hate to say this, but there are sort of rules, I mean, not rules, rules is the wrong way to be, you adhere to the rules and then you wrote a good script, that's not the way it works, but I mean, narrative is almost like, it's about sequential linkage, so when you're working on something and it seems to have a cumulative impact, it's very hard to say because it's very, there's no, even in the editing process you find yourself kicking 
yourself for the errors that you made in the script stage. So I think it's a big mistake when people say, I read that script, it was amazing. It almost always is a bad script because the <laughs> script, it's, well, no, it's true. Like, you don't look at a blueprint and go, that's the greatest building. You know what I mean? It's a, it's a, it's a very bizarre form. And it has to do with how much, uh, and I suppose this is another way of putting what you said, except a little less eloquently, which is, in a sense, writing is almost like a method process, for, for me anyway. You know the way that people make fun of method actors? Hey, the guy has to so method, he has to do things. Well, the writer has to feel the character he or she is writing very deeply. And if I find myself, if I haven't contemplated a specific character, what the character wants, what the character's about, so forth, I always find if I give my script to my wife or a friend of mine to read, they're like, like yeah, that character is not really... I, they can always tell. So I guess what I would say is the script is ready when I have uh, attempted to fulfill the commitment to all the characters in the script, or at least as many as I can. There's always a bit player that you can't do that with. To, to commit myself emotionally to all the characters. And, and then finally, of course, that the structure of the thing seems to make sense in a narrative way. And this is written about by, you know, Sid Field and all those guys. And I hate to say this, but to a degree it's true that there is, a na narrative anyway, that there is a structure that I like to adhere to. So it's those two things in concert. I'm, I, it's not, a gl it's, it's not, doesn't really serve a, a glib answer to your question. My experience is a kind of dialectical one, which you write something and you, and you, I guess you just want to passionately believe that it's really good. And then you give it to some people to read, and they say some things, and they state your sort of deepest fears, and then you go back and you <laughs> confront that, and you go, oh, okay, that wasn't good, or it wasn't, it certainly wasn't good enough. And then you go and get, you use that as the antithesis, and then you start working on this new draft, and you learn certain things, and often you forget other really crucial things in that, in that, in that second draft, and sometimes it ends up being a weird bastardization, bad thing, and then you'll get finally to something that you feel is, it is is it, and then that will reveal itself not to be it either. And you know, you'll read that, and I got to that. I got to this draft that I thought, finally, after eight months, this is. And then I read it again. And I thought, oh my god, you know, it just sucks. And so, and then you know, you really look look for an injection of something. And for me, in that case, it was like before I went and wrote again. I went back and read Chekhov for a, a week or two weeks solid. Just read, went back and read Three Sisters and. Cherry Orchard and Uncle Vanya and, and, and Siegel again, and then started writing and tried to figure out, you know, worked on the tone, and then you went back and do passes for each of the characters. Mm -hmm. But the real interesting revel then then what happens is everybody, somebody goes, okay, good, we're gonna make it. And then you hang on desperately to that thing, even to what's wrong. Because mm -hmm. you think, God, if I change what's wrong, they could take the money away, you know? And I, <laughs> I, 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 I secretly know, you know, about this shortcoming, but maybe no one's catching it. I don't have a better idea, and I don't want to introduce this, you know, topic, I don't want to, you know, take this all apart. But happily on this movie, there was a real problem in the third act, and none of, and you know, everybody else participates in that, that, that silence, because nobody wants to lose their job, nobody wants to go home, nobody wants to say, you know, the third act doesn't work, <laughs> you know? But in this case, you know, happily there was a couple of people who were just kind of curmudgeon-y and nasty, who would actually say to me, yeah, I don't know, I never really like, after page 80, I just am bored. You know, so finally I heard that enough that I, that, that I still wasn't gonna change it until I was told, we don't have enough money to do the stuff in the third act. And this was about six weeks before we shot, maybe less. And just simply because we couldn't afford it, <laughs> I went back and cut, used to, I don't know if anyone's seen the movie, but it used to be, you know, when Tolstoy, it, it, Sophia goes to the train station where Tolstoy dies, the James McAvoy character went to, to pursue his, his love in, in Moscow, and he didn't go to the, to the train station at the end. And because we couldn't afford to do Moscow, I had to, for some reason, I held on to the fact that that character didn't, wasn't actually there at the end. And it's like I'd changed and cheated on so much stuff in terms of facts, but that was a fact that I didn't want to violate. Who knows why that goes on in your head? Anyway, once I, I sent him to, to the train station, all of a sudden, the thing just kind of lined up in the third act in a much, much more positive way. And so honestly, it was just pure chance that you know, we just ran out of money. And, and that <laughs> saved me. You know, Tolstoy would love that. You know, he'd say, you're saved by your poverty. That's great. So. Yep. 
<laughs> well, I think. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. I'm talking up. No. <laughs> I was just going to say one other indication. I think is when you can. Or, I mean, at least for me, looking back, when I could, when I could really clearly articulate what the story was about was when I knew that I was getting really close. And it's funny because I said, you know, that I was reading the script over and over and I think that it was a way for me to kind of breathe in the whole story all at once was for me to like read it through without stopping and to kind of take it all in at once. And that was, I think looking back, it was actually really helpful to do that. Um, I think that that's, you know, really being able to clearly articulate is incredibly important. There's one other thing I would add. The the idea of being finished with the script, in a way, is kind of a mistake. Because, you know, I don't know, I'm, I'm Michael's going to kill me for this, but I'm a big Beatles fan. He's a Stones guy. And if you listen to the anthology records that the Beatles did, they do like 72 versions of the best song you ever heard in your life. And one of his very instructional is Beatles song on Revolver called Tomorrow Never Knows. And... Version one is really interesting and kind of great. And the version on the record is the best thing ever. And the version on the record is 53 or something. And the reason I bring that up is because really they're, they were very vigilant and incredibly rigorous about what it is that they did. And I think that holds true for screenwriting as well. And that the screenplay is an organic thing. And when the actors come and they improvise and all stuff, it becomes something else. And then you're editing and it becomes something else. And then they, then they say you can't work on it anymore. And that's kind of when it's finished. Because before that, it's always in a state where you something can get better, something can get more interesting. And one more point I would make, which is I think very important, which I learned the hard way. I don't like that scene. Means almost always, except if you're, unless your acting is bad or whatever. I don't like that scene means three scenes before you made a narrative mistake, which did not appropriately set up the scene itself. This is a very important notion for narrative storytelling, that it's all about A, B, and C, and D linking together to equal something much greater than, the, than that. Do you know what I'm saying? Or one, two, three, equaling 92, you know? Do you know what I'm saying? So each, so you have to, and, and the last thing I was like, if you have one or two people that have the same taste or virtually the same taste as you, have them read the script. Because what you're really trying to do is make the movie you would love. And those are the people you listen to. That's what I We're down to the last. Yeah, we are kind of out of time. We can do this last question if you have very quick answers. We've got to be out of here in five minutes. I'm going to try and make it quick. Um, between the pessimism and optimism, I'm here. Got a lot of good pearls of wisdom, so thank you. Um, my question is about, we sort of covered the composer, um, you know, editing, everything. My question is about, in my limited experience, my right hand on set, the DP, um, you know, it seems with last minute sort of organic, keeping the blocking organic, that these days more and more directors are saying shot lists are out the window and sort of just are created more by, you know, the performance and the blocking on set. I just wanted to ask you real quick, I don't know if this is a real quick answer, question, but maybe a first time director, Shireen, like how much did you depend on shot lists? What was your process with that? Well, again, this being my first film and having years to prepare for it, I, um, I, I storyboarded the entire movie in sequence. I wrote a master shot list of every shot in the movie, I think from like scene one to 137 or whatever. And then I broke that shot list down by, sh by our schedule, by shooting week and then by day. So yeah, I neurotically overly shot listed. And then, um, and I, and I, but I, you know, but I was very aware of the fact that I was going to get to set and sort of throw it all out the window. And I did that simply because I, I, I just wanted to feel prepared, and I wanted to know that I knew what I needed to get, and that was the most important thing for for me personally. And I, I think that that just going through that process um, for me, because it was my first film, was in, you know was incredibly comforting and in some way necessary just to give me the confidence to show up on set and feel like I knew you know, what, I, what I needed to achieve that day. Um, but we would get there and it would be, you know, I was always looking for something better. I was always asking, you know, asking or you know, taking people's um, nuggets of wisdom if they had a better idea or, you know, or whatever it was and just really working with the people around me to try and elevate anything that I came up with and anything that was on the page. Is there Twitter length input on this uh, before we wrap? Twitter link, yeah. 
I yeah, I, I shot list. I, I, I like to shot list, but I mean, you got to do something during prep, you know. It's, and, and 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 it's a good way to work with your cinematographer in terms of storytelling issues, like talking about what are you really trying to do, and like James was talking about finding the image or the blocking that somebody expresses what the scene's about. So it's really a good exercise on that point, and on that, and and sometimes it changes, and sometimes you shoot exactly what you plan. But I'm I'm much better off having a plan in my head that I can then throw out the window than, than not having a plan at all. Same for me. I shot list religiously, very detailed. I almost never use it, not because I'm that, I, I don't want to use it, but because it, things change. I have, shot, I have storyboarded in my life. I wind up throwing it all out. The only time I ever did anything exactly by the storyboards was for a car chase I did. Um, and it was a, a, a miserably unpleasant uh, experience shooting it because it was like paint by numbers and I hated it. So I, sh I think shot listing is where it's at. And then you can forget it. Thank you. You are all fabulous. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Shireen. Thank you, James. All three of you, good luck this Friday at the Spirit Awards. Don't forget to tune in 8 p.m. on IFC.